Hey, it's Don Coscarelli, filmmaker. I uh, just wrote a book. Check it out. It's called Fiction, Tales from the World of Phantasm. And uh, it can teach you all the things that you never knew about the Phantasm film series. A lot of interesting stuff. Horror, violence, not much sex. Check it out. Now available on Amazon, paperback, and Kindle. This is The Gala Show. I'm your reporter on the beat, Gala Avery. On this episode, it's the summer solstice today, and there's only one person I have on my show during the holidays. You'll know him as the director of movies such as The Rules of Attraction, the writer behind titles like Silent Hill, Beowulf, and Pulp Fiction, and as one of my co-hosts on Video Archives podcast. But I know him as way more than that. He's my best friend, my dad, my mentor. He's no stranger to my show. Please welcome back to the mic, Roger Avery. Hey, Dad. Hello. Happy to be here. Happy solstice. Happy solstice. Solstice for the summertime is the longest amount of daylight yeah. for the entire year. So if you're Indeed listening to this and you haven't gone outside today, go outside and play. It's the perfect day to do it. Yeah, and we're at some kind of crazy solar maximum with full moons and everything happening. So it's so there's no excuse. Is, yes. So no, no excuse for what is the question? <laughs> For tomfoolery. Forgiveness. I think forgiveness is a... There you go. There you go, Dad. So before I bring up the topic for today, I have a question for you. I went through all of my VHS recently, and I did it on my Instagram stories, Mm -hmm. and someone, some eagle-eyed listener, was like watching my stories and made a letterbox list of all the movies like we didn't cover that I had bought tapes for. On Video Archives podcast? On Video Archives podcast for our season one, and they actually made a letterbox list. So it had like Myra Breckenridge on it and like stuff like that. Um, But I was wondering, because I know there are movies that like you and I both want to talk about that haven't made it to the mic, but what are three movies that you wish that we had covered on season one of Video Archives podcast? Okay, so Quentin and I just got together and we're kind of, as you know, we're beginning our recording process Yes. again. And so um, we went together and we had like a little Mexican meal. A little powwow. We had a little powwow. And we went out and um, uh, I don't want to say made ground rules or whatever, but you know, it's it's the Quentin show and he has his his ideas of what he he wants to show. Kind of his pattern of the movies, like you've got a big movie that's like a well known film that's uh, you know uh, the blockbuster, yeah, the blockbuster film that everybody kind of knows about. (laughs) Well, maybe everybody knows about. Then you have like a kind of lesser film that. You might have heard about that. You should have seen. It's like the one seen. that you should have seen, you but you didn't. Seen. And then the last one is like the oddball movie. Mm-hmm. So our agreement was kind of like there has to be like a Roger movie mm-hmm. among these, which is, you know, something that I've kind of thrown into the mix every now and but, then. But what's funny about a Roger movie, because Quentin will say, oh, this is a Roger movie. And it's not actually a movie that you've seen before. It's a movie that he assumes would be a Roger movie. Well, his first assumption is always, oh, Roger likes science fiction. So if it's science fiction, it's a Roger movie. And like I, I told him, Quentin, that's not always the case. And he said, yeah, I guess it's true. You know, I uh, just because I like kung fu movies doesn't mean I like every kung fu movie. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And so... Um, um, and so I said, I, why don't we play a game? Because Quentin likes games and likes to play board games, board games and, and not ga- vi- not video games. Though. Games in life, he likes to <laughs> <laughs> he likes to play games. And so um, I said, why don't we make a game? I'm going to make a list of 100 movies. Oh. And actually, I'm only going to make a list of 90 movies uh, that are the Roger movies that are on my Roger movie list that are, and not all of them are movies that I've, that I've seen. Some of them Some are of movies them that you want to see. Like I kind of, La Boom. Yeah. Like La Boom is a great example of a movie that I am going to lobby and fight hard. It's actually not one of the choices. That... But, but you know what? I bet another choice on there might have been Fatso. Right. Okay, stop giving away all my well, choices. Well, no, 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 but, but you only get to pick three. And so I'm just assuming these other, like, 87 movies on your list. Right. Okay, so, but as long as you've given away Fatso. Fatso is one that, it's directed by Anne Bancroft. Oh my, it was that stars so Don DeLuise. It's produced by her husband, uh, Mel Brooks. Or maybe it's not, it's Brooks Film, but maybe it's not even produced by Mel Brooks. And I just think this is such a, a magnificent 
movie and such a great achievement as of a film and such a heartfelt film and so unexpected that I think it deserves like you know some bell ringing well you and I actually watched it on VHS together because all I had was my little tiny TV and so we decided like oh let's put something on and I had purchased Fatso for you to source it just to make sure yeah I hadn't seen it since I hadn't seen it since I saw it in release and so which was and when we put it on though it was Anne Bancroft is so good in it and Dom DeLuise is so good in it and technically it's like in the video archives universe because Dom DeLuise was in Haunted Honeymoon and so we already have that connection yeah it's a so, Brooks film and he's not really associated with this kind of movie anyhow that's one of the films yes, I want to talk and also about. and also it's the the mom and dad of uh, Max Brooks okay, we've, which, we've which now, was my guess which we've was my now, guess we've now talked about it enough that we have to just say that this is one of the three that you no that, no, no you can no, you can pick up three <laughs> others because this is the one I want to talk about okay. don't steal mine which okay. I stole from you okay you can pick three other ones okay what was the other one that you mentioned that uh I... la boom okay but la we boom. haven't seen that yet. yeah i haven't so. seen it yet but i just um and i also sourced that one yeah there was there's this guy on youtube tony mk i think is his name and i actually don't think he's on youtube anymore yeah i think all of his videos got removed because i was trying to show I, someone i think you know youtube slammed down on content creators who were using other people's music and make cutting music videos to them which i think is one of my favorite things to watch i love seeing young filmmakers use source material from movies and other things like that. And just because they, you know, they don't have the, the wherewithal to make a movie, but they're still cutting a movie. Using, they're doing editing. They're doing editing. And they're cutting these music videos. And he used La Boom and cut it to a Yaz song. Um, I think only you. Was it only? I think it was only, only you. you. And oh, it was so good. every time I watched it, I cried and I've never Same. seen La Boom. <laughs> But I watched this <laughs> this guy's music video and I cry every time I see it and I look at it and I'm like, oh my God, the way he cut it, the way the music is, and in fact, the images that he used in it, I realized, wow, without ever seeing La Boom, La Boom is visually in some ways identical to rules of attraction, or I should say cinematically, the language is the same. There's similar shots. It's It, it actually is like watching a... Well, a, a, an inspiration of mine that I had never seen it's, before. It's actually interesting you say that because when I was little, I remember that you wanted to do like a Rules of Attraction reunion music video. Yeah, set to, I still want to do that. Yeah, set to... Uh, don't don't say it. I won't say it, okay. But it's a Yaz yes song. But it's a Yaz yes song. Okay, I won't and, say it, I won't say it, but I, I've always thought about that whenever I listen to that song. Yeah. And so it's funny that like you say like LaBoom. Okay, but pick and three I just other ones ga- I just want to gather. I just want to gather together all of the, the cast. Uh, the, yeah. the cast of the film and just show where they would be now and then just do this kind of piece like a short piece an addendum piece and so i'm i don't know one day i'll do it if there's appetite for everyone you know to bother to call me back which many of them i I dearly love and i think they love me so yeah i think they all love me oh my god like (laughs) i mean i love it get over it i really i really really do genuinely love everyone they even love me like shannon shannon is so nice to me all the time yeah and i love james James and and i love ian and and kip and like like literally and there isn't a single person i don't love yeah and clinton of course especially above all and joe michael and joe michael (laughs) And, well, above all, Joe Michael, you know, I, all of them are above all. Anyhow. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so pick three that I did not spoil. Okay, so I'm going to pick three out of my list. Like, I started making this list, and I started going through my, my, um, you know, I was on Letterboxd, and at one point I kind of archived all these movies that I had seen, mm-hmm. and then I pulled everything right before we did the I video. pulled everything. You pulled it I for me. I spent hours and hours pulling everything. But I downloaded everything. everything, and I looked at my watched list, and I started going through it and picking movies that I thought would make good um uh, one's Roger potential movies. Roger movies for Quentin to pick from. And I just went through it now. And, and actually the embarrassing part of it is I'm actually embarrassed of some of the movies that are like my favorite films of that year or something. It's like, oh, did, did I really want that? And, you mean embarrassed? Like that you love them so much that you're like, you're actually, embarrassed you know that what? you like them? I was going to mention this one movie here. Actually, I'm going yeah, to give you four because it, one of them, yeah, I actually, fine. one of them okay. actually is on it's, my it's list. It's my show and, and I make the rules. <laughs> one of them is on my, is on my list of the Roger movies and it's a very influential film. And I actually in many ways really I love the movie but I'm kind of embarrassed that I love Which it. Which one? It's Cat People with by Paul oh, Schrader. Oh god. <laughs> when Cat I was a boy, people. I was in love with Nastasi Kinski. I'm still in love with Nastasi Kinski probably. I mean, I'm married and blah blah but blah. But mom mom allows it. Yeah, there's, yeah there's there's no <laughs> chance of anything. I just absolutely if I had a a crush as a teenager, it was Nastasi Kinski and Cat and in particular Cat People. It like just hit at the right moment and it's 
But when you watch it now, it's kind of like I'm embarrassed to you watch You know it's the funny though? Because like you showed it to me and we won't get into like why you showed it to me because I don't want to talk about that whole story because you know the pain and suffering that I went through on that. Right. Um, but you showed me and it's actually like something that I didn't like when I first saw it but I think about it all the time and it's I've, it's grown on it me. It is Okay, I love Paul Schrader, and it is a wonderful movie, and it is visual, and it is the music, the Giorgio Moroder soundtrack, which, as you know, I keep it at our other house, and I yes. play it when I'm writing. Yes, is that Giorgio Moroder, you know, down, now, 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 <laughs> like that? I just listen to it oh all the time. I and but in a weird way, it's just too like. It, it's too much of a window into my into your soul into my it's too much of a roger movie it's too much of a window in, of reflection no it's too much of a mirror into my adolescence a window into yeah it's a, a window mirror a, a mirror window. into a window a mirrored window <laughs> <laughs> it's a mirror into a window and, and and as i watch that movie i just think of all of my it's just it's too much and so that was on my list but i'm actually going to officially pull it well, maybe you and I list. will talk about it one day then, just separately. The mirror into the window, into the mirror I mean, into the window. Part of it is just the kind of weird, sweaty, masculine, masculine kind of energy walking around in it, combined with the sweaty female energy, energy just that's the going around energy. in it, and everything's all sweaty. And then this kind of, but but as far as these dreamlike sets and the the audacity of kind of making the, the film, audacity, the audacity, and how he, it's sort of his first sort of toe dip into almost kabuki like cinema Mm -hmm. because he moves forward and does mishima and uh i think even his well anyhow it doesn't matter so uh that was that was one of them that's actually not not the one of my three (laughs) i'm trying to think of like what my favorite paul schrader movie is well there's so many and there's many you haven't seen i I think there i I think there are many that i haven't seen i'm gonna think about it and so and uh but paul schrader is someone worthy of seeing everything you know even if you like three of his films he's a really good writer he's a really good writer he's a really good writer but you should see every you should see uh in fact it's been sitting on my stack because i want to show it because of the oh i want to see hardcore hardcore is the movie not my daughter oh my god it's my daughter yeah yeah it's gonna be a tough that's that's actually one that we should put i'll bet it's on my list okay wait a second (laughs) i have a story about uh about hardcore and i'm sure my friend frankie two films is listening but frankie and i met on letterbox Uh when he was still living in la and we met because he told me to watch Hardcore, and then I never watched it. And it is like the string, like the the very tight string that is keeping our friendship together is the fact that I've never watched Hardcore. Quentin, Quentin and I always, <laughs> um, uh, because you know what it's about, right? Yeah, it's about a guy that, okay, this is what I know, but don't spoil it if I'm this not is not spoil true. It. I'm... It's about a guy whose daughter has like disappeared into the porn industry, and so he has to go and find, and he's like a Midwest guy, but he's George right. C. Scott. Yeah, th- Yes. But but I like literally Frankie and I like our whole joke is that like he we met because he wanted me to watch hardcore like that's, that's not why no it's not why <laughs> it's just like when we started talking and, because I told him a movie to watch I can't remember what movie it was I'm sure he'll tell me and then he's like you have to watch hardcore and then just being me I just never did it because yeah, I just okay. do what well, I want well we I mean this is probably hardcore could easily be a movie Quint, see the thing is um, after seeing like all these movies like these big kind of keyframe films over the years like you know we all love hardcore hardcore because of what it is <laughs> because of like this weird calvinism that is yeah uh just emanating from the movie <laughs> but and also how like kind of just smarmy and creepy the, the yeah. film is and that it's kind of an la film in, yeah ultimately but um you know we're, quentin wants to like he wants new discoveries and he wants to go yeah, like, it's new to me though that's true. It is new to me. And that was his whole philosophy. It's like, if you haven't seen it, it's new to you. And that's video archives Yeah, well, he philosophy. needs that for him, though. Yeah, well, he can have that for him. But I need it for me, too. Which, right. I guess, is everything. Okay, give me your three. Because I'm getting sidetracked. Okay, well, har- hardcore. <laughs> no, hardcore is not one of your three. That no, was I one know, of but, mine. But hardcore should be on the list. And I, I don't know that that's actually technically a Roger film. But there's one moment where <laughs> Dorsey Scott has to do auditions. And no, don't. No, I, I have to tell you because it's the funny joke. It's the joke that Quentin and I always like. We play act it together, which in itself is kind of demented. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like Jersey Scott's doing an audition. He's sitting in a chair, and he's just one guy after another coming in. And the guy comes in, and he's like, does his little performance. He's like, okay, okay. Don't you want to see my cock? <laughs> Don't you want to see my dick? 
I'm pretty sure I've heard you and Quentin do this before, yeah. actually. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, like, does, like, they go through the whole thing. He's like, okay, thank you. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Oh my god! Okay, it's, well, it's I'm it, gonna it, I'm gonna move that up on my list to watch because yeah, you'll eventually have to watch it for the show. Okay, okay, so these are the three that I've picked that I am, and this is picking putting things on this list. The whole idea was that Quentin will have 90 movies to pick from. We're only doing like 26 episodes, and I'm giving him 10 write-ins so that if he doesn't feel like picking one of these movies, oh, that's smart. Then yeah, that it he allows has him to pick to to write in one. He should have to say it's a write-in though. Oh, yeah. No, we're going to have the, this list there. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the store. I'm going to pull the tapes and I'm going to build a section that he's allowed to pick from. OK. And if they don't have the tapes, I and will source it, them. And, yeah. And if, no, no, no. The tapes have to be archives tapes. Okay. They, they've got to have okay. been at archive. Okay. I mean, it's got to be. It's like it's the archives show. Every right? now and then I have to source a tape, though. I mean, it's true. If we have to if we really have to source one. But the fact of the matter is most of them I think we have. And yeah. the first one is is uh and i'm pulling this from the list because i'm being strategic i started making my list and i got you know just a little bit into my massive the all the movies i've seen like i just saw another one ticket to heaven um uh-huh. okay, but pick which what's number and three I, and so i'm putting these on my list and it's like oh my god 90 is like it's hard to narrow down to yeah. 90 that you want to pick and then you have to be strategic because you know, like quentin's not going to want to show for example this one that I was on my list that I'm now pulling um, immediately, which was The Spy Who Loved Me. You mean you're going to pull off? I'm taking it off my list. Because it's a James Bond film, because it's Roger Moore, it's almost too much repeating ourselves. Mm-hmm. And um, But I do love it. It's, you know... Yeah, it's funny because this is actually... Uh, this is I, right before Moonraker, right? I, I wanted it to be an example of did the Roger Moore comedy thing work for Quentin, you know... Uh, in the Spy Who Loved Me, well, okay, maybe, but okay, here's which the, is slightly but, a little bit more classic, a little less, you know, leaning Spy into its me own. Is Jaws is a baddie, so it's automatically not as comical as Moonraker, and I actually don't really like the Spy Who Loved Me. Like in the grand scheme of Bond, uh-huh. I mean, I should see where uh-huh. it, I know Dad. My dad's <laughs> like gonna get out the like. I just, I just have a lot of uh, when the movie came out and. Um, Oh, even nostalgia for it and love for it. Yeah. Anyhow, I, I love that. That's one. So I'm going to remove that one from my. But is that one of your three? Yeah, I'm actually going to remove it right now. What? You're going to okay. remove it right now? I wonder where the spy who loved me is I on my list. I literally, I just removed it. I just cut it off my list. It was film 60 on my list and it's gone now. And like, I Ticket to Heaven might go there. Well, do you already have Ticket to Heaven on there? Um. Yeah. And, and, and Okay. It was okay. number. It was number eight on my Bond list. So it still is like high ranking. But it falls for me below Diamonds Are Forever, but above Doctor No. I mean, I can see tons of movies here that I should start pulling. Like, um, okay, well, that's not my question though. No, my question is, what movies you're going to start pulling? <laughs> now, that, now that I'm my... realizing, because Quentin's never going to pick that, like that one that I'm looking at, or either of those. Okay, well, how? Okay, about... but here's okay, p- 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 pick okay. Three so this that is a movie. Want on this is a season. movie that I wanted. I, I would kind of like to talk about, but I just know that it's never going to come to pass. I know that okay, it's number three. This is number two. Oh, okay. This so Spy Who Loved one. Me was number three. Spy, oh, I see. I see. Spy, number, Spy Who Loved Me was number three. This is number two. Okay. I guess we're counting down. Yeah, we are counting down. The Draftsman's Contract. I have never heard of this movie. Peter Greenaway. And... Um, I've never heard of this movie. Like most Peter Greenaway movies, it's a puzzle film. He did um, like a Z in two knots, sometimes called Zoo. I've also never heard of this. He did. Uh, yeah, well, okay, so... He, no, it's pretty... I, I like, like, the fact that you have movies that even I haven't heard of because, like, I come from your brain. <laughs> so well, it's like... Draftsman's Contract is... Um, it's my favorite Peter Greenaway movie. Mm-hmm. And it, of his puzzles, I think it's the most intriguing of them and because it also has to do with Freemasonry and architecture and design and... Um, the um all the stuff one, that Roger one, loves yeah and <laughs> and, and actually and Freemasonry and, architecture and design and also none of that <laughs> I mean the movie is a is a somewhat abstract film and uh the DP who who shot the movie Sasha Vier- I think its name is Sasha Vierne I may have that pronounced wrong uh, I'm just doing it from memory is uh, one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen shot on, I believe, Super 16. You should not remove it off the list then because it, it, it's it, it is quite literally like the quality of the look of Barry Lyndon 
but on Super 16. Okay, you should keep this on the list, though, because like I've never heard of the movie. No, Quentin will never pick but, it. But you don't know that. No, I do know it. Oh, you do know that? I do know it. Okay, then I guess take it off the list. And Unless else. Quentin suddenly like comes back and after hearing this, and he would first have to hear it, and then he would have to call, come to me and fight for it, <laughs> in which case it's not going to be on my list. <laughs> no. no, I'm just saying it, it's like I know that it's just not his kind of film, and he would just find it unpleasant, and he... Okay. We would be watching it and it would be like chewing gristle for him. And he would just like be so happy when it was over and like, oh, can we now watch like something else? And like, do we really have to talk about that? I don't want to talk about that because there's very little for him to to say. It, it doesn't tick those boxes that Quentin mm-hmm. is really, really interested in. It is Quentin does not like pro forma, um, yeah. what he would call pro forma. Which is a kind of um, like over like. I mean, there is a reality where one could look at the draftsman's contract and say this is an influential film of someone like, say, Wes Anderson. And then when you watch Wes Anderson's work, what you're seeing is a kind of Gustav Klimt version mm-hmm. of an Egon Schiele painting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like mm-hmm. one could almost look at it like that. And so I find it very interesting. And I'm a big fan of abstract cinema. I think it's and it's not that it's abstract. It's kind of in some ways the opposite of abstract. Anyhow, The Draftsman's Contract, Peter Greenaway, check it out. Uh, report back and and actually on either of these if anybody really feels the need to fight for it fight for it and let us know on if you like really want to hear them talk about yeah either of these movies yeah at, at the uh at any of our social media things whatever yeah. whatever they you are you know I, where my dms are <laughs> like, i don't even know because i've yeah, been dad got logged out of instagram i logged out of instagram in. i had like a, a like a sudden sober moment <laughs> of like i've got to get off this addictive <laughs> thing and i flushed it down the toilet and then suddenly found myself like uh, the guy in train like a train spotting, like, like going into trend, the toilet. <laughs> yeah, going like climbing into it, trying to get it back out. And what I discovered was something worse than climbing into the worst toilet of. Uh, in... It was called WhatsApp. Yeah, it's like you have to get WhatsApp in order to get out of, uh, in order to get your uh, Instagram Instagram back. And I was like, okay, I don't need Instagram that bad. Well. People know where my DMs are because right. they DM me tons of things about video archives. So all by the, time. the way, whoever is trying to reach me on Instagram, I cannot like it is not a li- viable way to contact me anymore. It's over. It's over. It's over. And also, well, it doesn't matter. Okay, okay. what's the, well, the third the, one? The, the the first one, <laughs> number one. Okay, number one. Yeah, my because you count down, I count up. Got it. My final pick, and um. There actually might be a world where Quentin would pick this. Mm -hmm. And this is really a Roger movie. Like, I love this movie so much. I cherish the film. And it's Richard Benjamin's uh, film as a director, My Favorite Year. Oh, uh, yeah. With um, uh, Peter O'Toole and, oh my God, I can't even remember the name of the wonderful actor who plays... um, uh, Oh my God. Oh, Benjamin Steinberg. (laughs) Who's this Benji Stone I see on screen? When am I going to see a real name on screen? Benjamin Steinberg. Mom! Uh, Mark Mark Lynn Baker. Yes, Mark Lynn Baker. Oh, and Jessica Harper's in it. Oh, and I love Jessica Harper. And she's so, like, lovable in this movie. She is absolutely... In fact, you would love it because no, you she plays weird? a female I've, I've writer. Seen you've, this, seen, you've seen this movie. But I don't remember seeing it. I saw this on October 21st, 2017. Oh, it's one of the best movies about show business. And uh, Richard Benjamin really nails it. He really captures the, the truth of show business. Okay, idea. Double feature. My favorite year and The Stuntman. Um, well, I mean, sure, yeah. No, uh, Peter Sure, Tula. sure, sure. Why not? Why not? Sure. <laughs> It's like two movies. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> I can't believe I got a sure why not for my amazing I'm, double I'm feature I'm doing idea. my idiocracy voice. Yeah, I know. He's doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm my balls. My, I'm doing my I'm idiocracy my balls. voice. I'm my balls. Oh, God. It's my favorite hair. Okay, well, I'm going to throw in one <laughs> other movie that I know is on that list. And if it's not, it should be. Mm-hmm. And I actually think has a really good shot of getting chosen for season two of Video Archives, which is Starstruck. Okay, and reason- I actually purposefully did not mention okay. it because I was like, okay, I don't want to mention it because I know that I'm going to fight for it really. Like, well, I am you know lobbying. Else, you know who else will fight for it? Julie. Julie. Yeah, Unruly Julie will fight for it and she will come to my defense. Thanks, Julie. I can't do anything like like Quentin. He's just, he stands up and he actually grows. 
on, I, we're not allowed. And then <laughs> Unruly Julie will come in and the two of us with the the three of us. The three, I'm the, here too. With the power. I will literally show up. If we do that movie, I will show up either like in the dinosaur outfit. Quentin has, for the most part, kind of acknowledged that that, that, yes, movie, will that movie should happen and it will happen. And even though I don't think he gets it the way everybody else gets it. Yeah. I just, well, I, it's we'll a, see. It's we'll see the, what happens because that's my should, favorite putting on a show movie. That movie, even more so than Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like when put, I start like on the biggest show and, or all that jazz. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> fine. <laughs> that's Throw all of, that jazz at me. That's one of my favorite genres is putting on a show. Well, the boyfriend. That's another well, putting on all a that show. jazz actually is the ultimate, the ultimate show. Yeah. I just, uh, I don't think it'll be out by the time this airs, but I went on Craig and friends and talked that's with another Craig one. That's another one that Eric we, Clapp. that's another one that we will not have, uh, um, seen on the podcast, but boy, all that jazz. I mean, I hope that this is a movie great like uh, to cover all, it would be great to cover all that jazz on video archives. You know, as, as the story goes, as I understand it, Bob Fosse, who directed Cabaret. <laughs> that, that better be, I'm sorry, but that better be the story as it goes, because I just told everyone that was the truth. Oh, did you? Well, <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's it, the truth. It pretty much is the truth. He's on the, he's on the, <laughs> he's making the play Chicago and he has a heart attack and, you know, during production and the producer, and he, I think he discovers afterwards that the producers would have been in profit had the show collapsed because of the insurance claims mm-hmm. and blah, blah, blah. They would have actually come out way ahead. And so he kind of makes a movie meditating on that. And it's really interesting because you can see who is, uh, you know, the various real people in his life. And he's actually casting the real dancers yeah. and people in his life. And he's got Roy Scheider playing him. And it's just, it's such a great movie because, you know, I watched it and I was in tears because he, not because he's like such a lovable character. It's actually the opposite. He's, he's such a cad. He's such, he's selfish. He's, he's all these bad qualities, but like many men, I think can relate to this. And ultimately it's not a tragedy for him in the movie. It's those around him. Yeah. Who, who kind of lose him. And it's just a really, like, as meditations go, and supposedly Stanley Kubrick said it was one of the best films he'd ever seen. And I seen. totally forgot to say that, but yeah. that is such a... So I hope... Well, that, and he's also mentioned I mean, in the movie. I is. also, I give I give, I give, give Craig the permission to kind of take that little snippet of my dad and put that in the show. Sure. Because I, mean, I went and recorded that with Craig and then Eric Clapp from EC Films, who uh, gives me all the, bi- the Bobby Wygant uh, yeah. archives. Um, but so that'll be out eventually and just not yet. Wait, 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 Gala. it's time for a commercial break. I might be vegetarian, but that doesn't mean I can't enjoy a good spice rub. My favorite place to get them is Smoke Bros, a veteran-owned and operated business that sells premium handcrafted dry rubs, spice blends, and seasonings. Guys, you can even put it on your popcorn. My favorites are Honey Badger, because he doesn't give a bleep, and Jelly and Peanut Flavor Topping, because mm, 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 some things just taste better together. The website even has recipes, so go check out smokedbros.com to support a veteran-owned and operated business and fill your cabinet with delicious flavor. And we're back. I know for a fact that none of these movies are what we're talking about today. I know that that is not your topic because no. we have done it. I think people are going to be kind of surprised about what your topic is because I was surprised this morning when I got the text because typically for these like holiday movies, dad and I like to talk about a movie. You know, we talked about Logan's Run for a winter solstice. Yeah, actually. And, and I was I was thinking, oh, should it be, you know, The Wicker Man? Yeah, like, we, were, tr- we thought- were going through like what our, like, and I was even like, oh, like you, we could technically do like a Ralph Bakshi thing because we just watched American Pop together. Yeah. And, and Wizards. Fire and Ice. And Fire and Ice are kind of like solstice movies. I mean, Fire and Ice is so good. That's actually one the, that I'm going to push on Quentin as well. Yeah, I agree. So dad, 
my guest, as always, gets to bring their topic to the mic. But, Dad, what is your topic today? Okay, so I had, like, all sorts of topics, as I said, you know, before. The Wicker Man. We, and we really I woke almost up, did The Wicker Man. And I woke up this morning, and this movie has been like an earwig, like a bug, slowly <laughs> eating my brain <laughs> after, since I've seen it. And I've been thinking about it. And I don't want to say I'm troubled by it, but I'm affected by it a f f e c like i am highly affected by the film in ways that i didn't expect and i'm attributing that to the excellence of the filmmaker and um and the unco- and it's kind of a solstice theme because i f- i figured beehives and bees and the movie i want to talk about is a movie i saw recently called the beekeeper with jason statham and the reason i saw the movie is Wait, let's let's i'm gonna start the 30 minute timer because oh. i know we're gonna get into okay, it okay get into it okay so we are going to be talking about this the beekeeper. This is a tight 30 minutes. This we is a tight 30, 30 minutes. minutes. We only have 30 minutes because I know Dad We've and I... have just spent an hour talking about like, other <laughs> stuff. And, okay. So you heard it here. We're going to be talking about the beekeeper. I got 30 minutes on the clock. Our time starts now. Now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Really quick, before we get into this, Dad and I saw this movie separately. I actually took my mom to the movie theater to go see it. I like to go, as you guys know, to the Cinepolis. And I like to go to the dine-in. I like to order a big plate of nachos and an order of french fries, recline my chair all the way back, and have a great time at the movies. And I took my mom to see this, and I didn't tell her what we were going to go see. So we went in completely blind and I just, when we got in, she's like, oh my God, are we going to see the Jason Statham movie? And I was like, yes. And my mom and I had the biggest blast. I think besides Sonic 3, which comes out I, hopefully in December, unless it gets pushed, The Beekeeper is going to be my favorite movie of the year. And dad poo-pooed The Beekeeper. No, no, I wasn't. Yes, you poo-pooed this so hard, which is why I'm so happy we're okay, going to talk really about it. Okay, I didn't really know anything about it. I was just like, what? The Beekeeper? Just on the title alone, I was like, what are you talking about? And my mom and I had the best time. And so so I kept telling dad, like, we need to watch this together. Like when it's on video on demand, like all as a family, we need to watch this together. And he was like, no, no, no. Okay. So I'm, um, <laughs> it's no secret that I'm, um, both Quentin and I, we frequently kind of poo poo contemporary cinema. And that's actually one of the reasons I wanted to pick the beekeeper. Yeah. But also, uh, is... but to be fair, before you say that you poo poo contemporary cinema, like we champion stuff like the new Mission Impossible movie oh, or sure. the new Top Gun. Like we had so much fun going to go see that in theaters I, together. I just, I, I'm, I'm just like finding myself usually when I go to the movies a little less than happy at the end and less than satisfied. And I'm just like frustrated and all the streaming stuff and everything. Okay, so um, uh, having said that, um, the beekeeper. You you brought up the beekeeper. You had mentioned it. What I had heard from it almost unanimously from all my Hollywood friends, all my <laughs> jaded Hollywood friends, was great action, no story. Like no, really? no. That's actually really? what I had heard. No story. Don't, no. Don't name any names. Don't name no, I, any names. I'm purposely about not naming. Who told names. you? But I want to know afterwards who said that. Well, I will say one of them was not Quentin Tarantino because he has not seen the film. Yes. But after after telling him, like after basically when we were having <laughs> Mexican food the other day. Basically telling him, oh, my God, you have to see Oh, my God, it's like the Moonraker. It's going to be the Moonraker of season two. I started pitching it to him, and he said, okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'm in. (laughs) I get it. I get it. Okay, so um, it's no secret that I kind of do appreciate, like, um, I don't want to call it trash cinema. but I don't even want to call it schlock. I just want to call it, like... um, It's popcorn cinema. It's popcorn pushing. Semi-escapist cinema, and I feel like really good filmmakers when they apply themselves to those kind of films can do really excellent work. And so there's this guy, David Ayer, and I've always kind of thought of him along with a couple of other guys as sort of a contemporary of mine. He's a writer, director, film, yeah. director, produces things every now and then. And he's a uh, kind of has a, um, one might say sort of an, an aggressive sort of style well, in his films it's funny because like today when we were talking about who he was like i wanted the beekeeper completely blind going in on jason statham like that was my draw i didn't know who the director was i didn't know who the writer and was i didn't know that he directed it yeah and i didn't either i didn't know that and i love end of watch yeah like, I, I love end, end of watch, watch too. is like one and of, i love jake gyllenhaal and, yeah and in that and also is it michael pena in end of watch also is that who is the other person i might be wrong 
Um, uh, but I, if I am wrong, I'm sorry. But <laughs> I also just like love Michael Pen. Isn't Michael Pena an Ant Man also? I'm like just gonna start naming all these Michael well, Pena lore. Well, it, it doesn't. Ha- it, it doesn't it, matter. It, it, it is Michael Pena, by the way, in um in End of Watch. Yeah. Uh, and he's freaking fantastic in it. And uh, and I think that's probably why he's in Ant Man. Yeah, he's so which funny he's in even Ant-Man. more fantastic he's in. So funny, like he just gets better and better. But I didn't know everything. that Ayer directed. Uh, I literally went in on Jason Statham. Well, I okay. So even though I know he like, there's a lot of a, a lot of fellows in Hollywood who are filmmakers who I consider like contemporaries of mine who are just like other guys like me out there, like you know, trying to get movies made. He's very successful trying to get um, movies made. And um, and has done some really good ones. And the one that kind of clicked for me, I mean, end of watch. But then after that, uh, he did Suicide Squad. He wrote, and, he wrote Suicide Squad. Though. I don't think he directed Suicide Squad, did he? No, I, I believe he directed Suicide Squad. He okay. directed Suicide Squad. Okay. And um, uh, which is a, um, I mean... I think a uh, a visually exciting film, but I kind of tuned out at the very, very beginning. I just, I, I can't remember what happened. I didn't connect with it. I, I zoned out. I was in the middle of something. Maybe I didn't give myself a hundred percent to it. I actually haven't seen it. So, but I, but I, but I like, I think I watched like the first 10 minutes of it and then mm-hmm. was like, okay, this is like too energetic for me right now. Yeah. <laughs> like something it's like too, that. It's a little bit too like the style of it. Like it's just not my aesthetic. And also I think in that moment I was feeling very sensitive about life and, mm-hmm. and it was a movie that is very, you know, jaded and cynical about life. Okay. So he, he's kind of off my radar and, you know, for a little bit. Oh, I had also seen his movie Fury, the, the tank film. Which I have not seen, but I heard it's really good. And it's, it's, you know, it's quite a film. It's like a really, it's a really, really brutal, tough film, almost like too brutal and too tough. And so I kind of started associating him as, oh, this is a guy who's brutal and tough. Okay. So then the beekeeper comes around and you're like telling me, oh my God, you've got to see the beekeeper. My wife is telling me you've got to see the beekeeper. Yeah. My mom was like dying. And I'm like, (laughs) really? The beekeeper, the Jason Statham film? It's a Jason Statham film. I mean, I love Jason Statham and I, I, I love, but I, I kind of, Figured, okay, this is one of those. It's a programmer. Yeah, and it's okay. To, it's okay to go to a movie and want a programmer and love a programmer, but like I, the Beekeeper. Well, come on. yeah, I, and so I and I guarantee people are going to be like laughing at me for loving the Beekeeper, and they're probably gonna be like laughing at you well, for loving the Beekeeper. But they have not seen the Beekeeper. It's the exact same thing. And I know Dad, you're not going to get this reference. It's the exact same thing that everyone's doing with JoJo Siwa and that song Karma right now. We're like, oh, we hate that, but really, they're all oh, singing it in their I cars. Totally, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dad has no idea. I have no idea. I'll play it for you but later. But what I will say about The Beekeeper is I started watching it. And first of all, it freaking delivers yeah. on, uh, on, on on its audacious world world building. <laughs> and it's more than the action. Because the action is, you know, you kind of... Well, the um, action is audacious, with the bu- With the budget that they have, which is a pretty decent budget. And with the, um, uh, you know... The, the promise of Jason Statham in the film, he delivers A++ action, like really fun. Like the scene, my favorite action sequence, to be honest, I know everyone, like you're going to probably be bringing up like the, the call center stuff because like those are the guys that like we don't like in the world that are like ripping off these old ladies and stuff. But my favorite action part is actually at the gas station where he just like completely obliterates that female assassin that has come yeah, to get him. Torches her. He just torches her. With, like, yeah, well, okay, so... I'm watching the movie and this is the plot as best as I can understand it (laughs) is Jason Statham is like a, a, he's a beekeeper, (laughs) an agent, part of an agency like of like spec op guys of operators who are called the beekeepers, like a, like a a special unit and they are terrible. They are fucking terrifying. (laughs) And he's um, retired though. He's retired. And he's retired. Yeah, making honey and there's like a, a great joke in it where they're like you know and then you can just go back to making honey well, that's all i ever wanted to do and it's just like it's <laughs> no my my thing okay also... <laughs> but but wait let, let me get, let me let me just finish with this wait wait i, I only have 30 minutes so I've, I've got to be able to do the plot the plot as i understand it as i understand it <laughs> The whole thing about the beekeeper or the, uh, about the beekeepers is when there is something corrupt in government, they go and they kill the queen 
on behalf of liberty and democracy and everything. But they figure that out, like, throughout the movie, the female cop is like, what do bees do? And she's, like, reading the beekeeper manual for just, like, regular honeybees. And she's like, did you know that bees will go and kill a queen if, yeah, like, she's well, corrupt? And it's so funny because they actually have, like, what the bee... I'm sorry, I'm, like, actually crying right now. They actually have, like, what the bees do in the hive. And well, they actually yeah. work in, like, the real no, that's life. The plot. Into the- that's the plot. <laughs> and, and that's what's interesting is that you've got to go kill the queen now the queen as i understand it in this reality is hillary clinton the president of the united states who is president of the united states in this reality and she's a little bit of a of a um, oh my god no it's no no, no, no. she's a little bit of an amalgamation of characters we can say what it is though is it's not it's not when the queen becomes evil it's when the queen produces evil offspring evil offspring and her her offspring who is who is josh Josh hutcherson Hutcherson, who i delivering a a, an a plus plus okay performance here like an incredible performance but josh hutcherson is effectively playing a combination of Hunter Biden and Mark Zuckerberg. Yes. And it, and he's like this kind of combination of those two. And he's got some kind of spy software, some oh sort my of God. He, search okay. software that he's basically used. And the guy who's his kind of adopted father or <laughs> something like so that. I was so confused about that in the theater. Okay, that guy who's being played by, uh, is it James Cromwell? Is it like his or, stepdad? I can't remember it's who's his playing. stepdad, I think. No, it's, it's being played by um, Jeremy Irons. My God, it's being played by the great Jeremy Irons. He's effectively playing George Bush Sr., who used to be the head of the CIA. Oh my God, I and, know that. And was, and, and then, you know, and, and it's kind of been put into a combination of George Bush Sr. and um, what's his name? Uh, like Eric Schmidt, the head of Google. Oh, he's a combination of those two, and <laughs> and so everybody is these weird kind of cultural combinations. But effectively, it's about Jason Statham going to kill Hillary Clinton as president, so that he can protect the world from Hunter Biden <laughs> uh, and Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, so <laughs> that is a crazy ass plot that I don't he see anybody talking about. I mean. I haven't heard as much about this movie, so and I and I literally woke up this morning, just thought, okay, I, I've got to talk about this. I think it flew under the radar a little bit because it is. Just I cannot like a believe what this. Popper. Yeah, I, it, and because it's masquerading, and that's because David Ayer is actually a fucking genius. Yeah, he is actually a punk rock genius. He is he is succeeding where I am failing, and I, and he's giving me the light to move forward because in my own way, because. Um, what I saw him do was to deftly handle what was effectively a kind of Jason Statham programmer w- with this script by Kurt Wimmer. I think it's the, the writer. Yeah. The Kurt Wimmer. He's, uh, um, who, who has written, I think a kind of really interesting social commentary. I cannot wait for the second movie. Into I, this, I pray. Okay, no, okay, uh, okay. So the movie obviously does not deliver in the way that, it promises. What at are you the, talking about? I'm talking about, I'm just going to give it away then. If you don't want to hear the end of the movie, stop now. Cause I'm just going to give it away. Um, yeah. Spoiler alert. I'm spo- We're already spoiling the movie. I'm, spoil- so. I'm spoiling the movie. Um, in the end, he doesn't kill the, the, the queen that has produced the evil spawn. He doesn't do it. That's his job. And you're telling me that this guy, who is unstoppable, he is an unstoppable killer. He, he doesn't kill Josh Hutcherson. No, he end? kills Josh Hutcherson. You're supposed to kill him, but he doesn't kill the queen. You got to kill the queen. That's what the beekeepers are supposed to do. She's producing bad offspring. No, Josh Hutcherson kills his mom. She doesn't kill her. She yeah, lives. Yeah, he does. She lives. Yeah, she I lives. thought she died. No, no. See, that's just you're wanting her to <laughs> oh die. Oh my god! Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean the real characters. No, I mean no, the character no, no. in the movie. Okay. Who is despicable. She's a, well, and and she kind of finds a weird kind of, and, and they had to do that. They had to do that at the very end of the movie. It's not his fault that they did that. No studio would allow you to end the movie like that. That is insane to end the movie like that. You cannot end the movie with him killing the president. That like in a Jason Statham film, that oh it would God. be, that would be truly more reactionary than that. Whatever that civil war movie was, which. I'm now willing to give a chance what to. What Civil War movie? Yeah, that movie, there was a Civil War movie. 
Okay, I don't. Alex know. Garland, I think, made it. Oh, the one that just came out recently. Yeah, the British guy who made the Civil War movie. Okay, the, well, I, I'm st- I'm a little irritated by that. David Ayer has the right to make a Civil War movie <laughs> and to make a commentary on America because that guy's punk rock. In fact, I looked him up really for the first time. I'd never actually seen pictures of him, and so I looked him up. Uh, I know we looked him up. When we I looked him videos. up, and, and uh, so the picture of him that they have on like, IMDb. On IMDb, he looks like you know, Emilio Estevez in Repo Man. Like yeah. they've put him in a suit but you can tell his natural state of being is dressing like Shia LaBeouf in that tax collector movie he produced where that's awesome that you know that he's used to dressing you know like all cholo like and, <laughs> and uh what prefers that to prefers to be like all LA no okay <laughs> but, so, but, they, but I love that they have him in this suit where he looks like Repo Man so he literally looks like him like he's give... gonna be driving around with uh um, what's his name? Harry Dean Stanton. I have to give a huge shout out though in the beekeeper to Josh Hutcherson because I love Josh Hutcherson. I have it's always the best performance have, of the year. I it's have, actually the most dynamic like that. He, that guy gave himself to that role in a way that is just so freaking admirable. I remember. Like, okay. So the very first time, because everyone will know him from the hunger games because he plays PETA in the hunger games, but uh, diehard Josh Hutcherson fans will also know. Um, what was that movie? Uh, Detention. Isn't he in detention? Oh yeah, yeah. Detention. Detention's oh, you really mean the good. The movie by uh, Joseph. Yes, yeah. uh, that we saw at PIF, the yeah. Paris International Film Festival. I love that guy. That movie, I is... love that, that movie is a true indie film. That yeah. guy actually took his money and made a movie. Yeah, so and, if... and and if there is an an heir to Rules of Attraction, that is a successive heir. Yeah. Even though I don't think it really was in his DNA, I think he was just finding that on his own. I mean. That guy Khan, I think is his last name, made uh, like you know Britney Spears videos and yeah, I think he did the Toxic video and stuff oh, like that. So, he, so he's favorite. a visual, yeah. he's a visual artist. That guy. But anyway, Detention's really good. But Bridge to Terabithia, I remember the first time I watched Bridge to Terabithia, I was like sobbing and like bawling my eyes out that movie i can't even think about it without crying but josh hudgerson i've always loved him and when i watched the beekeeper and all of a sudden he came in and he was playing this like like little tech bro a-hole that i've probably gone out on a date with to be honest mm-hmm. like these are the kinds of kind of dad is yeah. like gonna crack some knuckles yeah. right now don't, don't make me <laughs> but uh he gives himself to the role so completely and he is such like a little snivelly like little like like what happened scumbag. what happened can i just stop for a minute okay, and just ask what happened to boys in this world <laughs> these fucking apps like i'm a dad now so i'm like kind of seeing it from the other end and it's like wait a minute this has become like like mechanized industrialized weaponized even. weaponized it's even weaponized. weaponized and like how is anyone supposed to like discover an honest true real relationship anymore yeah, well, with, okay. With apps the way they are. I mean, I agree with that. I'm going through okay, it. Okay, back to David But Ayer. back to David Ayer. Also, the funny thing about, like, The Beekeeper is that, like, I love the fact This guy's that... a true L.A. filmmaker, by Okay, but I I'm love... Like, I'm totally, you know, I love... Dad's a David Ayer fan. Yeah. Well, I'm from L.A. And, I, wanna, like, I should interview. I, can't I, I should interview David Ayer. I should get him on the show. Well, I can't believe I, like, haven't, really like, been more on this guy's... Uh, side. Not just side, but, like... The team. team. He's not been more on my... Ra- like, he has radar. been on my radar, but I'm really going to go watch that... Um, I just couldn't the garishness of it. I, I was, Suicide Squad. I was having problems with Suicide Squad, but I'm going to give myself to it and watch it. Um, and... Okay, but like my whole thing also is that like Jason Statham's just at some lady's house, and like he's the she's the only woman that's ever taken care of me, and then uh, she gets okay. She... That's the other thing. The way he handled the, if I can just say it, the yeah. DEI mandates that are given to him. Yeah. He does it like a freaking pro. He like looks at it and he says, "Okay, let's just go for it." He invents this cop character who is. Uh, unstoppable. She's the one person who can figure everything out. She's the one person who can actually and her really stand cool, up against a beekeeper. Cool but she's just like a cop and her kind of, yeah, dry... Who's a dad. Dry humor partner who... <laughs> I mean, it's so funny seeing... Like, he takes such glee and joy in just embracing the the current flavor of inversion that uh, that movies are experiencing. And he runs with it and has fun with it in a way that is completely, like, just lovable, Well, actually. it's also great that they don't make her into a love interest. That was the other thing. Like, I was actually so... He, he's not that crass. Yeah, That's he, the thing. He, he, he probably fought. He probably... I'll... Well, maybe not. Maybe he didn't fight. But one could say that her partner is kind of her love no, interest. No, her partner's I'll, a husband and father. Okay, her t- partner is Well, I'll tell you father. the one problem I have. And actually, if David Ayer hears this and he's listening, this is my one problem with it. And is that um, there is a moment where the beekeeper encounters her partner 
and her partner is basically on the ground and the beekeeper is, he's been killing everyone and he's about to kill that guy. And the guy's like, I have a family and the beekeeper doesn't kill him. He lets him live. And the proper extension of that scene of that would have been, she then shows up his, his, uh, um, the partner, his, his partner. She then shows up and she's like, okay, let's go. And he should, he should just be say, no, I'm out. Like, he just yeah. stared down the face of a gun. He stared down death. He stared down death. He got a reprieve. He, you're, I'm out. Like this is not my fight. Actually, what am I doing here? Is yeah. it should have been the answer. I'm going home. I have to, a family. I have a family. You keep going. I'm going. And even though I'm your partner, I'm going home to my family. That is who matters. And that actually, like, um, as as a point that's being made. Instead, he stupidly continues with her after him and again putting himself in the line of fire like he should have then be killed in 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 my logic yeah no i like agree he viol he violated um like the point like a a kind of moral a moral moment he violated and he was given a, an opportunity at life by a guy who only kills people who's just like he kills people so much that he, yeah, he can barely sure. he can barely find peace with the bees of being well, alone. But what's kind of what's kind of inter- I completely agree with that point by the way actually now that I'm thinking back to it. But one interesting thing it, is It really like, made me dislike that guy. I actually really liked that character until that moment because I have a family. And if that happened to me and somebody had a gun in my face and it was just like I have a family and they feel a moment of compassion and they let me live and they move on, I am not going to then pick up a gun. And chase after them. And chase after them. I am not. I am not going to take a gun in my hand and then violate what just happened. Like that is a that is a moral ethical moment that is that David Ayer actually incorrectly, um, I think, incorrectly handles. Now he may have a better argument for that than I do, but um, well, one thing I really like about that, the logic my, that was my feeling of the. I loved the movie except for that. The one and thing and I- and he should have killed uh, the Hillary Clinton. <laughs> The Donald, president. Donald Trump character. I mean, we can almost say that it's he, he. I think it would be unfair to say it's Hillary Clinton that he's making a perfect amalgamation. Well, of it the is two. a perfect because well, his like his a, version of an amalgamation. Isn't of she the also two. like a talk show host or something? Also, like on top of it, is she's she Oprah like, also? Yeah, she's like Oprah also. Or, or, I think. or was she just on a show? No, I think she's like starts off as a celebrity, so she's like a like a celebrity president. I mean, it's what's interesting about the movie is he's just taken everything in pop culture like and mushed it together culture, yeah. in a big sticky ball. <laughs> and then well, you've got to deal with it. Okay. So in like, a sticky bomb. Didn't he have, Oh no, that was saving private. Ryan, not, um, not so Fury. one thing though, that I really like about the beekeeper is like the logic behind him. Like in like his, like who he kills because I like when he goes into the call centers, the first thing he says is like anyone who hangs up the phone and just goes home. No problem. Like I have no problem with you. You can quit. You're just like a cog in the machine. Right. And, and then what happens is like the boss comes in, like the big old boss and like literally it says like if anyone leaves, like you're fired and like you're going to get a raise if you don't leave. And so no one chooses to go. And then, then he can go crazy because they've all made a choice. They've made a choice to harm people. They've made a choice to steal from people. They've made a choice to take uh, to take advantage of people. And I love this whole idea that like who are the disadvantaged people in our society? The elderly that like are having their money stolen. They've worked their entire well, lives. Even even more than that, it's we are all victims of criminals. Yeah, and, I mean, if we really they they may wear a red hat, they may wear a blue hat, they may whatever, but they are. It's a, if you're a criminal, you're a criminal. Well, also like I. I watched this dad when I was going through all my fraud stuff. Like, I remember when I had like all that fraud that I had to, I had to go to the police. Yeah. About you it. were actually dealing with it. I was it actually this, dealing in, with in it. In real when time. I, <laughs> like when I saw this movie, I was actually dealing with it. And so I was like, yeah, get them. Like get the fraudsters. And then to find out that like all the fraud money that they're stealing is actually like being piped into like, well, it's like cryptocurrency, like Dogecoin or Bitcoin or whatever. Um, And then like also like into his mother's political campaign because he knew they were going to lose yeah. and he didn't didn't want his mom to lose so he conned all of these old ladies and old men out of their money and like their inheritance but i just like i love what it says though is because i think personally there should be some kind of respect for the older generation and i i think this movie kind of encapsulates that like there is a lack of respect for the older generation and these people have worked really hard their entire lives saved up yeah, bought a on house. that same note they should not be picking up the phone and engaging with well i agree <sighs> but sometimes they have dementia yeah. or sometimes they think that like and they're fooled i've been fooled by things like you think oh that, like, i got something... fooled i got fooled yesterday i went to the car wash 
and I was getting changed so that I could tip somebody. Mm -hmm. And the guy at the at the desk who I like this kid at the desk, I know completely like did a kind of cash shuffle with me like he was like starring in Paper Moon. (laughs) (laughs) Like he did a total thing. And I just trustingly took the money and I kind of walked out and I was outside or whatever. And I went for a little walk and I was waiting for my car to get done. And I looked at it. I was like, wait a minute. He shortchanged me $10. Okay. It could have been an accident and I'm taking it as though it were an accident. Uh huh. But, um, you know, it happens. It happens. You did have you, to, you, did ha- you get your $10? No, I decided at first I was like, well, I'll just take it out of the tip that I'm going to get. Cause I, now I'm, now I've got like weird money to give the tip. Uh, and so I, if, and then I thought, no, it's not that guy's fault. I'm just going to like chalk it up to Roger. You need to pay attention in life. Yeah. Like, don't be stupid. Okay. Well, next time you go to the guy outside, the good guy, you know, my guy. Yeah, no, I know. I know. <laughs> you know, my guy, I love that car wash. So I'm disappointed in the new, the new hire shortchanging <laughs> my father. I think I got to go to my beehive. And, I, like... and then I thought about it and I was like, just because I assume that he, ripped me off on purpose at first doesn't mean that he ripped me off on purpose no it's it's quite possible he just counted incorrectly handed me my thing were you guys chit-chatting no um (laughs) sometimes it's hard like sometimes when you're chit-chatting it's like you could just like do that happened to me once at the grocery store if i was chit-chatting i would have been the one to end up with 10 extra dollars (laughs) no okay i I would have been the one to like i was at the grocery store once and i was i was chit-chatting with the guy and i paid and then like he got I think he got flustered by my by my charm yeah. <laughs> and like lost count. See, of- <laughs> like it doesn't necessarily mean that it's nefarious. No, it's not nefarious. It can and be so fine. I just was like, okay, like. So it- one thing I want to ask you about the beekeeper, though, is like, how do you feel about judging a book by its cover? Because when you first were told about it, you didn't want anything. Like you didn't want to see it. I really had to. Well, like, I and was- then we didn't end up seeing it together. You got you did end up watching it with mom. I think I have seen a couple of movies recently that are that give me a little bit of hope. I think Cocaine Bear actually gave me hope in cinema mm-hmm. because I feel like it's the rightful heir, in some ways, to Piranha. Yeah, um, and also it takes place to- in that same universe and. <sighs> And I was completely surprised by that movie. It's kind of a weird Canadian, like, I don't know where it's made, Atlanta. Well, it's Elizabeth Banks who directed it. Elizabeth, And she does a bang up job. I was shocked by that film and by The Beekeeper with how violent and how crazily violent but it's and like over the top violent. violent. Right. Um, like how, it's not so dark. Well, it's funny violence because you're you're basically dealing with an audience that is jaded by violence, and so now needs their violence dished to them as comedy. Okay, but like I I know you haven't seen Furiosa yet, or if you will ever, I'm not sure. Oh no, sure. I, I will. It's George Miller. Um, I'm, but, just, I'm slow these days. I'm slow. Well, I I, I, I don't require want to... a cane and a walker. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> to get into my wheelchair. Yeah, right. You don't even <laughs> qualify for like AARP right now, Dad. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> Someday we'll get the discount at the hardware store. Someday. Someday. Um, no, I went with a friend to see for his birth or did we see for his I don't think we saw for his birthday just because he really liked the movie. I went to go see Furiosa and you know what? Like George Miller is who I would expect like funny violence from. I put that in air quotes because like Thunderdome and stuff like that, like Master Blaster. Like that's kind of like funny violence, but also like really like, oh it's yeah, but then so... you, but then you have Mel Gibson who is a brilliant humorist. Like yes he's a dramatic actor, but he's also incredibly good with comedy. Yeah. And he, the what made you want to follow his max was his kind of rolling of his eyes as he's like desperately trying to blow the whistle to like, you know, affect uh blaster. Mm-hmm. And um you know the the kind of that moment which almost becomes like a cartoon that's what i mean though and so i just feel like stuff like the beekeeper and cocaine bear have that cartoon element that kind of allows me to laugh at like violence or bad situations and then just like going thunderdome of course has like it's also gut-wrenching like the end of that sequence um but i feel like like the new furiosa movie like didn't have that for me at all like there was no element of comedy and so the violence is just violence it's just gratuitous it's just it is well, and i don't get down with that well i, I Oh, this is the train killer. <laughs> I can't stop. Yeah, I haven't seen it, so I can't comment. <laughs> no, you all, can't I, comment. all I know is that um, George Miller is one of the greatest gifts to he filmmaking is, we have. Yeah, I and, agree. Um, That's why I feel weird that, even saying anything get, negative at all. No, about... I know. Well, he's. It's not like he's made. You know. Well, Happy Feet is like one of the greatest movies of all time. Is it? Yes. Uh, 
Yeah. Is it? <laughs> yes. I know there's a whole like happy feet versus surfs up camp. Um, I know no, you're I not thought it was, in... I thought you were going to say like happy feet versus like Lorenzo's oil. <laughs> Why? Happy feet's in a penguin movie, dad. Why would it be against Lorenzo's oil? Well, they're, they're both George Miller movies. So oh, no. one is happy feet and one is Lorenzo's oil. <laughs> no, happy feet and surfs up. They're both penguin movies. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I get it. Surf's you get up, it. Yeah. yeah. No. And people like surfs up better, but I like happy feet better. So well, I I like that one moment in Happy Feet where the kind of reflection of the digital people and the window oh, that's so weird when he's in the zoo is so realistic so looking and it's, weird. and it's unsettling how the reality that he's in, which feels like a reality. But um, so do you think the beach for me be- for me Babe, even though he doesn't direct Babe, Babe he, is Babe Pig in the oh, City gosh. also, but but his production of Babe is Babe is so good. But you know that I watched that double feature sublime. with it. You know, I watched that double feature in sixth grade with Andromeda Strain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah. the monkey. With the, oh, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> That's probably also why I don't like monkey movies. Okay, I feel like get the idea of the monkey out of my head. Do you think the beekeeper should have a sequel? Well, I mean, it doesn't matter what I think. Like, no, it does matter what you that, think. That, That's that, my question. That is actually something that just gets triggered and happens automatically. And so I but would say yes. Do I think David Ayer should be... Um, uh, directing and, it, directing it, and should Kurt Wimmer, and I hope I'm pronouncing it, Wimmer, Wimmer or Vimmer, whichever one it is. Uh, I, I hope that this team reunites with uh, Beekeeper too, because actually, I you know, I would love to see more. Although, I think they said everything they needed to say. Personally, it would be more. It would definitely be more, but it would be. Yeah, it would be more. Maybe it takes place during the the early days. <laughs> I don't know his yeah. life before his life. I, and also, can I just say I just love his hat. The uh, did, did we mention oh, his yeah. crazy hat? He's wearing this crazy hat. The baseball cap thing or the <laughs> trucker cap that he's wearing. Mom that, and I in theaters. The whole movie. It's just <laughs> and his kind of that that it looks like he's shrunken a little inside <laughs> of his clothes that he's wearing as, as he walks around and. Oh my god mom and, and i literally the entire movie were talking about the hat we were like what oh there's the timer but and i just want to say i love jason statham just, i love jason statham I do too love him. i think he has gentle eyes i, I really do i met him once um for a for a movie and we met at a hotel somewhere and he sat across from me and as i was talking to him i was just staring into his eyes i was like god he has such gentle eyes like this guy should be in like romantic movies you know like uh romantic comedies uh, I'm when, sure he's but done them those right. Romantic uh, comedies. He would be so good in romantic comedies. I don't know if he has. To be honest, I think he's mostly just done like the kind of action, well, like Fast and Furious, The Meg, Crank. Yeah, I, I love Crank. Um, but also like one thing I just want to like like a little shout out is uh because I always say Tom Cruise is like the last action hero of like our generation. Like, is anyone else going? I think Jason Statham's also right up there with him. Not maybe to the level of Tom Cruise, but... Uh, the, the, he, that, that, that like, you know, <laughs> it's called life. We're in it. It's happening kind now. Of, it's happening now. Jump. Let's jump. Yeah. But, <laughs> let's uh, jump together. But Grab also, my hands. Like, We're jumping. <laughs> just also, like, I love that these guys are not, like, huge tall guys but they feel huge and tall on screen like jason statham's only 5'10 tom cruise is only 5'7 if those heights are accurate they may be boosted a little bit but it just or, goes, or, or diminished a little or bit. diminished a little bit who knows but it just goes to show you that like you don't have to be like a six foot four uh muscle guy to have the presence of an action hero no in fact um cinema loves uh it doesn't really matter in cinema because the camera kind of makes everything it also doesn't matter what you what you want is to be a pro appropriately sized with your co-star so that you don't have these problems when you're shooting where somebody is at somebody's belly button and you know and you're trying to frame the two of them in one shot that's and also so, real life dad that's also real life I'm no i know that's a real, shout out. i know that's real life but this is one of the reasons why in movies we you know we it's 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 a visual it's a visual thing it's a visual storytelling yeah. thing and you have to be able to frame things and yeah so. but you can have big a big man energy and still be Five yeah, seven. well, yeah. I mean, that's, listen, that's all I gotta say. I, I I would say Tom Cruise is one of the biggest men in the yeah, world. I, yeah. I agree. I agree. Like he, to me, he is uh, like incredible. He's incredible. Jason Statham's incredible. We love those guys. I love, love these guys, and we love the Beekeeper. I love action movies. I love. Uh, I mean, what uh, you always hear me say that there are two kinds of movies. There is escapism, and then there are movies that make you ask questions when you leave the theater. And so one, you know, you leave the theater and you kind of leave the movie behind the other one. 
you're asking questions. And what I found about The Beekeeper, which was really unusual for me, is that it's an escapist movie. You can leave it behind. And most people will think, eh, there's no plot to it. But it actually stuck with me. And I was asking questions afterwards. And I was thinking about it. And I really, I directly attribute that to Kurt v Wimmer and uh, David Ayer. I think uh, these guys are actually really, really brilliant filmmakers and i really really wanted to say today on this solstice on the longest day of the year how much uh how much i appreciate their work and that is all the time that we have for today but dad is there any final 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 thought that you'd like to share with the audience no Thank you to my guest, Roger Avery, for coming on to the show. If you'd like to keep up with my dad, um, you can do so on his website, avery.com, you know, since his Instagram is logged out. And I don't know if you use Twitter anymore either. A-V-A-R-Y. A-V-A-R-Y. Dot com. Dot com. I'm Gala Avery, and this has been The Gala Show. Happy solstice, everyone. Happy solstice. The Gala Show is brought to you by Insertomatic. This episode was executive produced by Roger Avery and produced by Gala Avery. Music composed by Andy Milburn. As always, I'm your host, Gala Avery. Copyright 2023, all rights reserved. Despite me sharing the same last name with this charity, I don't have any affiliation with it, besides the fact that the issue is very near and dear to my heart. Did you know that in the United States, 2.7 million children currently have a parent in prison, and it's estimated that 10 million children have experienced parental incarceration at some point in their lives? I was one of these kids, and as an adult, I am really grateful to be able to give back to Project Avery. Their mission is to build leadership from within by supporting community through programs such as mentoring and outdoor education, and also to remove the stigma surrounding having a parent that's incarcerated. You don't have to feel alone. If you know a kid who could use these resources or would like to donate money or time to the charity, please go to Project Avery, that's A-V-A-R-Y dot org, to check out what this amazing charity is all about. Again, that's Project Avery dot org. Thank you, guys from the bottom of my heart.